dogs, it's good to be here. Um, before I share what I have to give you tonight, just to tell you why myself and Judy are here and Tim somewhere, at, right up the back, Tim's come all the way from DC, so he's come almost as far as us. Uh, he's part of the Best Semester program, which is involved in getting you guys to experience another culture by spending a semester studying somewhere else. And we're here to try and coerce you, uh, manipulate you, bribe you into coming to Australia because it's the best country on earth other than America. Um, we, we love Australia, but we're loving our time here. We uh, had such a profound experience of the uh, Best Semester program with our student. But you, with this program, you live with an Australian family for a whole semester go to college and get to experience what it's like living as an Australian. And uh, we had a student last year from Oregon at uh, George Fox Uni and he got married on Saturday night so we got to go to his wedding. So we flew all this way to see that and since we're in the area we thought we'd drop in because there's a William Jessup student with us at in Brisbane, Australia right now. And uh, I think there are any of the, the three coming next semester, are any of you? Yeah, one, two, Gosh, there we go. So that's really exciting. And we will hopefully get see a fair bit of you when uh, you come over. Uh, a little bit of where I'm from. So uh, Brisbane is a subtropical climate, a little bit like, um, imagine going to live in Miami for a semester. Uh, beaches, sunshine, rainforests, mountains, the Great Barrier Reef, not far away, with coral and beautiful fish like Nemo um, <laughs> and Dory. Um, and, um, and Sydney, you get to go to Sydney and you get to go to the outback and you get to live with an indigenous uh, community. So that's a little bit about just for a few days. Um, and, and eat witchetty grubs, which are really weird things. No, you probably don't have to eat witchetty grubs. But that's our version of the best semester program. Um, and uh, so we're also here on holidays, we've got another week to go and uh, so we've been invited to come t today and had a, I just want to say you guys are really warm and friendly, we've really felt welcomed, profoundly so today, so it's been great to be here in Rockland. Um, now my message. So something happened on July the 14th while you were all on summer break, something amazing happened for the entire human race on July 14th. Does anyone know what that was? Think back, summer holidays, just a bit after Independence Day, something that the humans achieved that we had never achieved, and we can't, can't imagine that we could have achieved it. We did something extraordinary. Nobody? It's amazing how quickly we, we forget our achievements. I'll tell you what it... Hmm? Somebody have an idea? Okay, I'll tell you what it was. I actually got to go back because you know. Pluto. Pluto. Yeah, we got to Pluto. Well, not we. I, I didn't get there. You didn't get there. But something we built got to Pluto. But it got to Pluto because on January 19, 2006, we launched a rocket into space faster than we'd ever launched anything ever into space. And then we passed some ast asteroid and then a bit over a year later it swung around Jupiter and it used the gravitational pull of Jupiter to slingshot it all the way to Pluto. And it took nine years, to, just over nine years to get there. Nine years, and, and you know what's amazing? Is it ended up about 9,000 miles above the surface of Pluto, which is the distance of here to my home in uh, Australia. 9,000 miles is all it is. It's like seeing from above, uh, that kind of distance. And it arrived 72 seconds late, but exactly where it was supposed to be. To put that into perspective, it's like hitting a golf ball with a grain of sand, but the golf ball is moving at 10,000 miles an hour, and the golf ball is 500 miles away. And you hit a dead center. That's how accurate it had to be, which is pretty amazing. Now, why am I saying that? What's that got to do with anything? This is called foundations, and I understand that this is all about how the Word of God, how the Bible is the foundation for our lives. Well, there's a reason I'm going there. To make any sense of the Bible, any sense at all, you've got to read it with one word in mind. 
And it's not love and it's not grace and it's kind of is Jesus, yeah. But the word I'm actually thinking of is actually that reminds me of a joke. This um, kid in Sunday school and he's about seven years old and the Sunday school teacher goes, I'm thinking of an animal and it wanders through the desert and can have one or two humps and go for long distances without water. What's the animal? And Jimmy puts his head, I know that. Uh, uh, uh. And the teacher goes, yes, Jimmy. Well, it sounds awfully like a camel, but I know the answer must be Jesus. <laughs> so, so, no, I'm actually not thinking of Jesus. I'm thinking of the word trajectory. To really make sense of the Old Testament, which is where I'm going to park for a little while, you've got to get a sense of trajectory. In ancient times, they saw everything as circular. You're born, you, repro- you get married, you re- or you have children, you reproduce and you die. And they go through the cycle and nothing ever changes. Everything remains the same. The book of Ecclesiastes even talks about that. Everything keeps happening the way it's always happened and always will. And you could easily think that's going to happen to you. You know, that you're born, you grow up, you go to college, you get a degree, you get a spouse, you get a mortgage, you get kids. They grow up, they go to college, they get a degree, they get a spouse, they get a mortgage, you get rid of your mortgage. They have kids, you have grandkids, those grandkids grow up and then you die and everything just keeps on happening. And you can just sit on the, on, on the freeway, on the interstate, and go, what's it all about? What's the point? My parents did this, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. You know, I might be doing it in a slightly more comfortable car, but what's the point of it all? I seem to be going flat out, and I love God, and I want to go to be in glory with Jesus and worship him forever, but somehow, how's the kingdom hit me now? How does it change my life now? So this circular view can still predominate. But what we did, especially since the Reformation, since the Enlightenment period, is we started to see time as linear. So this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and so we see life as a sequence of events. And because since the, the Enlightenment period, we've kind of created this upwards and to the right trajectory. For you, that's upwards and to the right. I think that's right, yeah. Upwards and to the right trajectory. I'm reversing it for you. Um, so everything gets bigger and everything gets better. And we can build bigger cities and taller buildings and more profitable companies and more efficient, more blah, blah, blah. And we think of life as linear, not circular. But there was a guy many, many years ago who didn't see life as circular and didn't see life as linear. And I want you to imagine life as neither of those things. And that man was first known as Abram. In Genesis 12, verse 1, and I don't have any slides because I want you to kind of stay with me for this. In Genesis 12, verses 1 to 4, this is what it says. Now, you can easily hear this and go, yeah, yeah, blah, tune out, tune out. This is just a final grand. This is boring. This is, it. this is actually really exciting. If you understand it in its context. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. It's basically like saying, you don't have a GPS, just head out the front door, leave the keys behind, leave your wallet behind, leave your phone behind, leave all experience, all their stories, all of their diet, all of their food, leave the grocery list behind, leave all provision behind and go somewhere. But I'm not telling you where. Would you go, I'd like to go on a, on a journey which you won't come back from and you don't know where you're going. I will make you into a I will make you singular into a great nation and I will bless you I will make your name great and you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you will be cursed and all people on earth will be blessed all people on earth will be blessed through you So Abram went as the Lord told him and Lot went with him Abraham did something different It's like doing the same thing over and over and over and over until someday somebody did something different. There's a story uh, in the Talmud, and this is how it goes. So Abram has a father called Terah, and Terah makes idols, and that's his business. He makes money by making idols for people to worship. We still do it, you know. We call them factories. I'm going to own this beautiful Porsche. It's going to be my wonderful car. And he had all these idols, and one day, Abram walked into his father's workshop, 
and smashed every idol except the largest one that was standing in a corner. And Terah walks in and sees his place completely smashed up, all his work destroyed. And he goes to Abram and said, what did you do? And Abram said, no, no, that, that big one on the corner did it. What he did is he exposed the stupidity of what his father was doing. The same thing over and over. He recognised that there had to be, there must be something greater, something beyond, something profound, something wonderful. The cosmos must be enchanted, to put it in other words. The cosmos must be enchanted. In other words, to use Einstein's words, there is really only one question we need to answer, and that is, is the universe benevolent or hostile? That will sh change how we do everything. Now, he decided that the universe was benevolent, that there was a God who created everything, everything. And he was good. And he was good. And so he left his father's home. How did he see life? Not as circular, clearly, and not as linear if you read the story of Abram. He saw life as spiral. Now, what do I mean by spiral? He would die. His son, Isaac, would die. His son, Jacob, would die. His son, Joseph, would die. And generation after generation would die. And for the next better part of 400 years, they would be in captivity in Israel. But thousands of years later, there'd be a whole bunch of Christians acting like complete dorks going, Father Abraham has many sons, many sons has father, I am one of them and so are you. And you all laugh because, let's all praise the Lord. We do, we do, don't we? Because he is, he's the father of our faith. Now, Abraham could not possibly have known that I'd be acting like a complete dork talking about how I'm one of his sons, children but we are his children. The world was in some ways still circular. It still turned. People were born and people died. But something changed. Someone put a new ingredient into the mix and that ingredient was faith. 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 Now here's the problem. You might hear people, and you will hear people, beg the Bible, big time. They'll take it. In Deut Deuteronomy 21, it says that if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her. Now, we think of that as absolutely abhorrent, the worst thing you can imagine. How on earth can you follow a God who told his own people to marry your rapist? I'm sorry? Stay with me. Stay with me. This is kind of really important you get this. Because this is the only response. We've got a God who says wholesale genocide to all the other tribes. K kill everybody. Every man, woman, child, every animal, kill everything. I want death everywhere. Blood flowing down the streets. And you're going to have, as you go through life, people who will attack Scripture and tell you it's barbaric, hostile, primitive, ugly, stupid, and you're supposed to believe in a loving God who suddenly became all nice and gentle since Jesus, but was a real tyrant until then. In fact, he was worth, worse than ISIS. So what do you do? How do you respond to that? There's a whole lot of silly laws in there, like you're not supposed to touch the skin of a pig, and you've got this thing called American football, where you touch the skin of a pig every time you pass it. That you've got to sow herbs and plants differently in rows and all separate. Okay, here's where I want to go with it. When you were little, the very first steps you took, your parents probably videoed. There would have been a phone call from, from your mum to your dad saying, you're not going to believe it. He, she took his, her first steps. When you said your first word, someone would have come running. <gasps> Bob said dog. 
dog. You don't ring your parents from college and go, dog, <laughs> what did you learn today? Sky, um, you've got past that. And, and if you were looking at little you from adult eyes and expecting that child to know everything, that would be incredibly unfair. That would be incredibly unfair. We could criticise the, the, the Pluto program is called New Horizons, which is a really good metaphor for what I'm, where I'm going with this. You could have criticised that program one month in to say, that's pretty useless, it's only got to around about Mars. In fact, it hasn't even reached Mars yet. What a useless probe, it's supposed to go to Pluto. It hasn't even reached Mars yet. Give it time. It's on a trajectory. It's on a trajectory. Until Abraham chose to obey God, human beings were still crawling around the floor of the cosmic nursery. We were still making so many stupid mistakes. We were still killing our own children to try and keep some mythical God happy. Fast forward 500 years, 600 years plus past Abraham, and you've got a people that they're enslaved in Egypt. But they hold together with a set of rituals and stories that have much better value than the Egyptians. The Egyptians, there's only one person who matters, and that's Pharaoh. The rest are all just trying to serve Pharaoh's needs. But in Israel, everyone mattered. Everyone mattered. And when they finally got set free with God's help, he started giving them laws. Those laws were not to keep God happy. They were to bless us. We have a thing called weekends because God said have a day off. We have a thing called graduation ceremonies and birthdays and wedding celebrations and so on and so on because God said, honour your mother and father that you may live long and happy and be blessed in the land. These were given to us. If you notice, the trajectory is starting to have a direction that you can see. Now, if I was going you know, wherever the moon is, and I don't even think it's out right now, but if I was going to point just slightly off, you wouldn't know I was off target until you got way off into space. If I pointed just next to the moon, you'd think, yeah, that's pretty good. But the thing is, is even if the trajectory is head on, you won't know where it's going until it gets there. And you can judge it from its earlier position. The, the Ten Commandments were an extraordinary departure from the status quo because the Egyptians never gave the Israelites a day off and they would steal their women and kill them if they got in the way. And that was commonplace for those days. So I said earlier, what about this passage where rapists have to marry their victims? Well, do you know what happened if you're a woman and you got raped back then? You were probably stoned to death or at the very best abandoned. Pregnant, with no means of provisional support. There was no system of welfare and you were a piece of garbage, an absolute piece of garbage. And so God said that's not going to happen anymore. In the previous chapter, Deuteronomy 20, is a passage called the Spoils of War where the Israelites would go in and take over a nation and uh, men could take the wives of their enemy to themselves. But he's, Deuteronomy, the Lord, set down some laws. You can't do it. You can't be with her for a whole month so she can grieve her husband, and then you can, and if it doesn't work out, you've got to let her free. You can't make her a slave. You've got to set her free. Now, we still see that as misogynistic and brutal, but compared to those days, that was women's liberation on steroids. But we just don't see it because we're here, not there. And do you know why we're here? Because of trajectory. We are grasping constantly grasping what God is saying. Now, which takes me back to New Horizons. Those scientists were freaks. They were geniuses. They knew stuff I don't know anything about. They worked it all out in advance. They planned exactly where this probe was going to go before it ever got off the launch pad. Every piece of information, how much it weighed, the gravitational forces of the planets and the sun, all of them. They had to work out this asteroid that swung around. The whole works were exactly where Pluto would be at a given moment in time, nine years, nine and a half years in advance. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 6 and 11 to 12, Eugene Peterson in the message translates this. Long before he laid down, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. What delight he took in planning this. Hold on to that. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Verse 11, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eyes on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone, in everything and everyone. The universe is unquestionably benevolent. It's exuberant. It is lavishingly drunken with love. The, 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 the great engineer, the genius scientist of God, before the foundations of the world, in other translations, had planned this trajectory from the beginning. He'd worked it all out. He couldn't say to where we were, how lost we were at the very beginning. I don't know if anyone's read the Ted Decker books, Red, Black and White. But you can't start with a people who know nothing or believe that God is this tyrant, this judge, and you hide from him as we all do in our sin. That's the very nature of sin, to hide from God, to believe he's a judge, to get us, like Adam and Eve did in the garden. You can't then say, I love you. You have to prepare. So in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says that God sent his son into the world in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, when the set time had come, it says in other translations. What does it mean, the set time? Well, guess what? The Romans had built roads and a safe way of traveling from here to there. They had created an empire which enabled the gospel to spread. And the Greeks had provided a language, Koine Greek, which enabled it to be broadcast and written and recorded. The Jews had got to a place where they'd understand that God desired mercy, not sacrifice. And they understood that when a man hung on a tree, this was the ultimate, final, and ending of all sacrifice. Physical sacrifice. For there is a God saying, I forgive you, you don't know what you're doing. And the Jews had developed the understanding of God as the creator of all, saying, this is how I am towards you. Finally, finally, you can come home to the garden. Finally, you can come back to the garden. And way back, with that guy called Abraham, you know, I said it was spiral, even his name changed. Way back with Abraham, God said, I'm taking you to a land you do not know. What land did he take him to? Canaan, Israel. Guess where that is? It's the hub between Europe, Africa, and Asia. And if you want to spread the gospel to the entire known world, you put a few acres of land right there. Why else would you want it? God knew. So what's the theological equivalent of New Horizons arriving at Pluto? It's an ordinary carpenter who stood before a crowd and said six times, you have heard it said, but I say to you, six times. He took scripture and said, this is where we started departing from the way things were. An eye, and an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was a limitation. Before then, someone takes your eye, you kill them. He says an eye for an eye. He says, limit your vengeance just to what they did to you. But Jesus is taking it now and he's turbocharging it. 
Jesus is Jupiter, slingshotting this probe all the way out to Pluto, and that's us, that far from the awareness of God's love for us. He's arriving to show us love. So Jesus is taking it, but I said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, now the sixth one, love, he said. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. Oh boy, yeah, you better believe it. Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. It actually is um, from Leviticus and the Jews were told to love one another, which is pretty reasonable. Guys, just, you know, you've got to live together for the next X number of years, sharing dorms and so on. Get on. Love one another. You're going to enjoy your time at college a lot more if you do. Stands to reason. But the Jews just assumed that meant hate everybody else. And we can easily think that. I know in America there is a slogan you guys like. We don't use it in Australia. We don't even use a variation of it. And it is God bless America. I want to invite you to say, God bless the world. God bless the world. God bless humanity. God bless creation. God bless this planet. We need it. All of it. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. So easy when we have identity in our belonging system to say that is who we are. So, you have heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may, have, you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain, rarely in California, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, he blesses people who you might think aren't deserving of it. So I want you to do the same. Paul calls that burning heaping coals in your enemy's head so that you will pierce his heart with your love. What's he going to do? Do you know what? I look at that and I'm challenged by that. I go, I don't love my enemies. I don't. It's not part of my makeup. But I do have Christ within me and I find it is part of his makeup. I want, people say, well, isn't that all outmoded? Isn't that irrelevant? Well, no, because we haven't even reached that place yet. We're so far short of truly, in our hearts, loving our enemies. Now, right now, what I want you to do is think of somebody who's your enemy. You won't have to think too hard, I'm sure. Someone who you would cross the street if you saw them coming. Someone who, when you think of them, you go tight on the inside and go, wow, they caused me pain. You're really blessed if you haven't got anyone in mind. It's normally pretty easy to think of someone. Human beings have barely scratched the surface of that impossible but wonderful truth. He's imagining, Jesus is imagining reality at dimensions that 21st century educated people can barely comprehend. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is the lens of all scripture. He's the destination of the trajectory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the only hope of glory. The only hope for our planet. The only hope for our planet. That passage, just what I just read to you, when I look at TV and I see ISIS and I go, they're horrible and they should all die. Let's put bombs on them. But of course there are children there and there are women there and, and there are very, very lost men, young men mostly, teenage men, teenage boys. I don't have easy answers. All I know is that Jesus is the answer and that's where Jesus is the answer. I don't just want to follow him because he died for me. I want to follow him because he lived for me. Because his wisdom was better than any wisdom I've ever come across. He is the word made flesh. He is still light years ahead of anything we have in constructed society. So I'm going to finish up with a quote by one of your own, Martin Luther King Jr., I'm going to change two things about this quote. I don't know if Martin Luther King had these two things in mind, 
But I'm going to put them in your thoughts and I want to challenge you with them. You can look this quote up if you've never heard it. I don't know how familiar you are with his speeches. But he said once, The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It bends towards justice, but here's the thing. It does not bend on its own. It bends because each of us, in our own ways, put our hand on that arc and we bend it in the direction of justice. Now, there are two things that I want to comment about that he didn't mention there. First, we only know which direction justice is. We only know how to bend it, what way to bend it, because of Jesus. The moral arc of the universe would normally tell me, well, guess what? Murderers, uh, justice is punitive. You're going to suffer because your victims suffer. And you're going to suffer long and hard until I feel justified. Jesus tells me something else and it scares me and it challenges me. And the second is incredibly powerful. And that is the word justice, I just said it could be punitive or it could be restorative. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards restorative justice. I saw the word justice around here while I was walking around. The two words most used in the Old Testament for justice are tzedekah, tzedekah, tzedakah, I'm going to pronounce it right, Now, if there are any Hebrew scholars here, I'm going to get shot down in flames, which is usually translated as righteousness, but essentially means charity. We see righteousness in the Old Testament. It means charity. How did the Jews show show this? Widows and orphans. Look after them. Don't reap the whole field. Leave some for the refugees so they've got food. Yeah, your job is to provide one-tenth of your crop for refugees. Do we provide one-tenth of our GDP for refugees? Not even one percent, probably. Barely. And the other word we see for justice in the Old Testament is mishfa, which is often translated judgment, but which speaks of vindication of the poor and the powerless. Already you'll notice way back then, the spiral was spinning right out out into the outer galaxies, out into what is called the kingdom of God, God's great dream. Restorative justice. When Jesus told this parable, we could miss it. He said there was a shepherd and he left his 99 sheep to go after one lost sheep. Now I want to put that in terms of what he meant. He went, went off, he went he left the 99 sheep who are doing what they should be doing, who are obeying the laws and getting it right, and he went after one scoundrel. He went after one who no one would go after. He went after one and put it on his shoulder and carried it home. You're mine. You matter to me. You matter to me. That's the trajectory of Scripture. That's your role as you become whatever field you're going to study. If you're going to be a teacher, you're going to look for the kid who's struggling to learn. And you're going to want him to learn. You won't see him as a disruption in class. You'll ask the question, what's his home life like? If you're going into psychology, counselling, you will be working with the least, the last, the marginalised, the broken, whatever their age is. If you're going into any of the sciences, then you're going to be asking questions. How do I make this world a better place? And the team I work with, how can I build a a great team spirit? You get to practice that now. Otherwise, your career is about a paycheck and you'll live a circular life. And then you will die. God favours humanity. The ones that we would say he doesn't. Can I get the musicians to come? (sighs) 
I'd ask a question. Just close your eyes. I asked you earlier, one person you know who you really struggle. When you think of them, you go tired on the inside. You feel angry towards them. You'll notice how hard you're holding them inside you. How you're waiting for them to pay up whatever debt they owe you because they owe you a debt. And there's no doubting they've hurt you and there's no doubting that that hurt is wrong. You have experienced injustice from them. What I'm asking you to do is to notice your breath and notice Jesus within you and what would Jesus want you to do? No, you can't love them straight away, but perhaps you can just start to soften your grasp, soften your grip on needing to be right and then be wrong. Maybe you'll find yourself just slowly, gently letting go of that part of you that will not forgive them. Maybe for some of you, the person you're struggling to forgive is you. Maybe you failed yourself or you failed someone close to you and you feel so bad about it. And you can't believe that you deserve forgiveness, that you can be forgiven. It says the prodigal son came to his senses. He came to his senses. He woke up that there was a father waiting for him. And Jesus came and died and rose again that you might know there's a father waiting for you. There's a father waiting for you. If you would like someone to pray for you, just put your hand. Father, I thank you that you do not leave us alone. That you sent us another comforter. That this spiral would go out into all of our lives by the power of your Spirit. Never left nor forsaken. I ask that your Holy Spirit would empower the release of that hurt, whether it's towards them or caused by them that everyone here who is holding on and struggling with forgiveness would notice your love within them helping them let go that as the waves and the wind crash against the house of their life they will know standing strong within them, holding them up not by their strength, not by their might but by your grace help us all Heavenly Father for we all come to you poor and before you you make us rich Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. It's good to be here. May you be blessed.